Hello and welcome to the Tuesday, May 30th, 2017 edition of the Sands Internet Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich and today I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida. Attributing attacks to particular actors is a difficult and often controversial task. Often politics, for example, affects attribution to assign blame to a convenient target or to attribute an attack to an adversary powerful enough to explain the inevitability of the breach. Nobody really ever wants to admit that they got hacked by a not very sophisticated attacker. Pascal uh, wrote a nice diary on Monday that introduces a more objective method to compare different hypotheses when it comes to attribution. This method, known as analysis of competing hypotheses, does recognize that definite attribution is often impossible and it focuses really more on ruling out entities that are not responsible. In my opinion, one of the main advantages of using this model is to make sure that you are not getting locked in to an attribution decision by one particular interesting and convincing piece of evidence, maybe a piece of code, maybe a string or a comment in the code that you have seen before. But then again, you know, sometimes code is copied from one actor to another. So uh, to properly assign a blame, you really have to avoid this. And uh, this model forces you to look at all available evidence and to properly assign weights to evidence based on how reliable the evidence is and the relevance for each fact known about the attack. And well, to make things a little bit more specific, Pascal promised a second part to this particular diary for later in the week. And uh, I believe he's planning to actually apply uh, this particular model to recent events. And well, Windows 7 and 8.1 users are vulnerable to what could become a rather annoying denial of service vulnerability. If a user attempts to access the Windows master file table as part of a directory path, then the system will just lock up. To include the master file table, a user would have to add the string $MFT to the path, which is of course highly unlikely that a user would do that willingly, but the bug is actually exploitable via Internet Explorer and Firefox, not via Chrome, by tricking the user into loading a web page with an image link that includes the $MFT as part of the path. The vulnerability will not lead to remote execution, so no big risk there, but will only lock up the system, which of course in itself can be annoying, in particular if, for example, this particular image tag or so would spread more widely. The bug is similar to a bug that affected Windows 95 and 98. Well, back then in the 90s, including the path con slash con caused a similar crash. This particular vulnerability was originally published on a Russian language website. I'll be linking to an English news article that in itself has a link to the Russian original if you're interested in that. And late last week, a blog post by Securalytics disclosed a vulnerability common in many email encryption devices, according to that blog post. Securalytics calls it an SMTP split tunnel exploit. In many ways, it reminds me of a similar issue with transparent proxies that uh, are used for HTTP. A proxy intercepts HTTP, uh, or in this case, SMTP, MTP terminates the connection and as far as later systems are concerned, the systems that are receiving the email now, uh, for example, from an encryption device, which is the main topic here of uh, this particular blog post, these uh, systems then no longer know the original IP address of the sending system. Now in HTTP, this problem can be mitigated uh, by adding additional headers uh, that list the original IP addresses. For example, you may have seen these X forwarded four headers that are often used there. In SMTP, we have received headers uh, that can be used to list intermediate uh, steps, but these headers, just like in HTTP, the X forwarded four header, they can be spoofed by the source. Now, according to Securalytics uh, work, this inspection 
isn't done often. So what I can do is if I can reach the email encryption decryption device directly, I can essentially fake that the email already went through some kind of a content filter and then the email encryption device will no longer pass it back to the content filter. And that's often a rule that you find to prevent loops of email. So in this case, the email would then be forwarded directly to the user and no additional inspection would happen. Now the tricky part is how to defend against this. Of course, a lot of this is vendor dependent in how all of this is implemented. If you first have your email go to a security appliance that checks if the email is valid, if there's any malicious content, then it goes to some kind of encryption decryption appliance. Then of course you can make sure that the encryption decryption appliance is not reachable from anywhere but that security gateway. So all email is forced through a security gateway Way and nobody can send email directly to that appliance. In case the order is reversed, then of course you have to make sure that this encryption gateway is passing on all email to the security gateway and that no spoofed information like additional headers can be used in order to bypass the security gateway. Of course, ideally we would have one stop that has both the security function and the encryption function. That way you don't have this handoff issue. But then again, based on the email volume and such that you have to deal with, that may not necessarily be an option. Your best bet probably is to check with your vendor, but uh, overall, I don't see this as a huge risk. Uh, first of all, make sure that any encryption gateways are not reachable from outside your network unless they have to be. Well, uh, this is it for today. So thanks again for listening. And in case you ever come across a story that I should have covered, uh, send me an email, send a message via the ISC contact form or just tweet it. Thanks and talk to you again tomorrow. Bye.